Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this first issue briefing on day three of the annual meeting of the new champions. My name is Oliver Kahn. I work at the World Economic Forum. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce this session. Before I do, I want to give you a little bit of a, 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 a potted uh, rationale for these, this format, it's issue briefings. We try to tackle some of the more topical uh, issues and items on the news agenda in issue briefings. They tend to arrive on the program quite late. We tend to um, organize these in the days before the meeting. But really, what we're looking to do here on the outer edges of the, uh, of the meeting and convention center is really you know, get, a, get a good handle on some of the more you know, critical issues facing either the global economy or the global state of industry. So um, very few subjects more topical than the, the subject of global debt. We are. Um, 10 years on from the global financial crisis, we're 20 years on from the um, Asian financial crisis. Um, if everything comes in threes like London buses, then we should, we should be concerned. Um, we have two very esteemed speakers for this session. I'm very, very honored to be joined by Mr. Ju Ning, Professor Ju Ning, the PBC School of Finance and Associate Dean at the National Institute of financial research at Tsinghua University. Lutfi Siddiqui is just finishing another session, actually, and he'll be down in a couple of minutes. But we only have 30 minutes. I encourage you all to be as energetic and proactive as possible. So if you have any questions, please do stick your hands up. Just to get the party started, I'm going to um, get a few of my own in there quickly. Uh, Professor, uh, by way of brief introduction, your blog that you published uh, on our agenda websites this week is the most popular blog we've published during the whole meeting. 20,000 people have viewed it in three days. Wow. So um, it's obviously a reflection on the quality of your writing, but perhaps also it's a reflection on the fact that this is a subject which is top of people's minds. Um, we are looking at, um, as you point out very, very, very clearly in this article, uh, we're looking at a 10 years on from the, you know, from the Lehman crisis. Um, some people are saying that there's, uh, there's many similarities are, are, are still here. We've, in fact, grown global debts by around 50 or 60 percent since that time. So um, the obvious way to start off this session is to ask, have we been sleepwalking into another impending disaster? And I don't mean to be sensationalist here. <laughs> Well, I, I hope not. Uh, actually, uh, I have personally lived through the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. I joined Lehman Brothers three months before its bankruptcy in Hong Kong. So I, I think, I mean, we are in uncharted water in the sense that, well, the, the non-traditional monetary policy that has been carried out by major central banks, including the U.S. Federal Reserve, is really something unprecedented. So if we have lived in the traditional world, I think I will be far more confident that we are going into another debt crisis or something like that. But given that what the, the unprecedented large amount of liquidity that has been injected into the system, and also given the consorted uh, efforts from central banks trying not to walk into the same problem again, I think that's sort of giving me some confidence or alleviation in a way that, well, back in 2007, not too many people are raising the alarm saying there is a crisis coming up, whereas now I think we have more discussions of that. I've done quite a bit of research on bubbles and crisis. I think one key nature of bubble is, well, bubble often form when people don't think it is a bubble. But if we are concerned with crisis, I think certain precautions have already been taken trying to prevent one or at least reduce the marginal impact of one. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very interesting. So on the one hand, we have, uh, yeah, we have uh, an expansion in, the, uh, in, the, in global debt, but we also have greater awareness of it. And which of those forces is, is bearing out? We don't want to talk up a, a, yeah, the prospect of, a, um, yeah, of, of, of anything going wrong. We really, really don't. But what are the, what are the big risks that we, that we need to get a, get a grip on? Well, I think if we talk about an expansionary policy, I think the bigger concern with that is probably twofold. One is the accumulation of debt. The second is the labor productivity is not growing as much as what is warranted by the increasing level of debt. So I think two things are both at work in the sense that, well, if you look at Europe, I think the labor productivity is really not going to grow anywhere fast. But then and we're still living in the aftermath of the sovereign debt crisis, which is about a decade ago. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the picture in the entire emerging e economies are more encouraging in a way that many emerging economies have been making the efforts of trying to uh, engage in meaningful structural reform and they have probably become 
they have better uh, foreign reserves, their economy is more resilient, and they have engaged in more market-oriented reform. So I'm hoping that that is paving the way for a more sustainable and a more resilient system for the emerging economy. Because mm -hmm. I think that the, the problem with crisis is always, even though it often started with a policy from the, the developed economies, it is always the emerging economies that's going to take the bigger part of the impact. And then I think with the, the ever increasing integration between the developed and the emerging economy, I don't think it is realistic to talk about the decoupling anymore. So whatever happens in the emerging economy will eventually circle back and haunt the developed ones eventually. Which is a really interesting point, because you're right, decoupling has kind of exited the, uh, the vocabulary in, in, in the past 10 yeah, years. Exactly, yeah. In the past 10 years. Um, but we also need to be mindful of the, that, that, that very fact. So we have interest rates in the US likely to continue to rise. We've yep. already seen very likely a couple of problems around the world in Argentina and in Turkey. Um, I was reading this week, uh, and I forget the research paper, but other countries, Philippines, Hong Kong, Mexico, other South Africa, yep. there are other at-risk countries, and they're sizable economies as well. So um, bearing that in mind, and bearing in mind the, the, you know, the close integration of a global economy, what is the kind of status of the, of the, the risk at the moment? Well, I, I think it is probably fair to say that it is very difficult to see the occurrence of the risks beforehand in a way that, well, when the risk comes, it's always taking the, f the, the, the shape of the, the a black swan event. So I think it's very hard to see that coming uh, beforehand. But then I think, I think there are two things that's really alarming. One is, uh, it's, it's not about the absolute level of debt, it's about the pace by which that debt has been increasing. I think in particular, in many emerging economies, in particular China and uh, to a certain extent, some of the countries which are already in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the speed by which the debt is increasing is quite alarming. Second is, I think I mean, there is sort of this false sense of complacency in the way that what well, the foreign reserve has increased, what well, the, the fundamentals of the economy has been improving, but then I think many of them are heavily dependent on the assumption or of the, the expansionary monetary and the fiscal policy that has been happening in the past decades. Once that tide shifts or when that, that tide comes out, I think that is concerning in a way of the asset prices will fluctuate and that will uh, quickly eat into the, the bottom line of uh, those companies companies or governments which are on a reasonable level of debt right now, but with the deflation of asset prices, I think they're going to face increasingly uh, difficult challenges uh, going forward. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Luffy, thanks so much for joining us. You've just come from a, a live television debate where you've been discussing. My, my apologies. No, which is absolutely fine. We like to, we like to work you, so we're, we're, we're very glad that our strategy is paying off. Uh, Luffy, you're a visiting professor in practice at the London School of Economics. Uh, you're also adjunct professor at the National University of Singapore. Um, previously, again, uh, managing director at a global investment bank. We've just been hearing from Professor Juning, who, was, who joined Lehman Brothers three months before uh, the global crisis in, in, in 2008 <laughs> yes. and has since then adopted a more sustainable career path, path <laughs> right. possibly. Part of the uh, reason why I'm back in academia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, honored that you're in fact, you're in fact a member of our Global Future Council on long-term investing. And maybe long-term investing is something that we should be talking about. The, the, just to pick up the pace in the conversation, yes. um, we've been talking about that kind of the, the, the trade-off between better or greater awareness of the risks of, yes. of bubbles growing, but at the same time, uh, you know, a greater increase in build-up of debt and possibly even yeah, the uh, worrying acceleration of, of debt acquisition yes. around the world. And um, we're trying to make sense of that. What are your thoughts? I, I heard the last bit, I think, uh, where you, uh, let me pick it up from there, which is that it's the pace of growth that is of uh, the greatest concern. If you look at it as a global aggregate, uh, the speed of credit growth uh, in the last five years uh, it's been relatively uh, slow and stable in the developed world. So much of the, about 80% of the growth has come from the emerging markets. But that also in, its, in itself is not necessarily a matter of risk and concern. What matters is the mismatch, mismatches inherent within it. So let's argue for, for the moment that China is a closed system and you have a bulk of reserves and you have a uh, huge the potential uh, growth in a huge parts of the country yet to be urbanized, uh, fourth industrial revolution only beginning. So of course you need more finance and capital to invest for the future. And if it's a closed system, it's possible at a macroeconomic sense that 
it can carry a lot more debt. It's a greater problem if there are mismatches of the kind that you have. Uh, I know Argentina and Turkey are seen as, as the poster children right now, uh, but you don't have to go as far out as that. Argentina and, and Turkey stand out because their current account deficit is about 5, 5.5% five um, yeah. of, of GDP. Indonesia is less than 2%, but for them it's a concern because the mismatch comes from the fact that about 30% of their debt is in, denominated in US dollars, and about 40% of all of their government debt, domestic currency and foreign currency, is held by foreigners. So it matters who's holding your bonds, because um, uh, if they're buy and hold, they don't mark, mind mark-to-market -market fluctuations. That's one kind of investor. But if they have to sell, at the slightest sign of concern, then that's an, another type. So it matters who holds your credit, and it matters the currency mismatch and the duration mismatch. So a lot of their credit is due in the near term. And those mismatches are what we need uh, to be mindful of. Uh, of course, the trade war context has made it um, uh, even more urgent in that many emerging markets are stuck in a pincer movement uh, where on the revenue line, they depend on China buying their stuff, and on the, um, on the cost line, they depend on US dollar interest rates or the US dollar not being too strong. And if rates go up and the dollar strengthens from the denominator, and China is not buying your goods as much as before, because they were pre predominantly intermediate goods that were then aggregated and going to the US, then you get hit from both sides. And then your debt carrying capacity becomes even more uh, of an issue. Let me stop there uh, and see if there's anything else. I, I've, got a, I've got a feeling we're going to have quite a few questions, but before we you know, slip into that phase of this very brief session, um, let's just kind of look, look at the kind of um, angle of what we do about the situation we're in at the moment. We, we're not reigning in debt, it's growing. Are we managing it successfully at the moment as the, the big C word contagion keeps kind of rearing its head. Um, so far Argentina and Turkey is isolated but you've mentioned a couple of countries um, before you arrived. I was reading a research note, uh, Philippines, Hong Kong, Mexico, there are other vulnerable economies too. So what is, what is the best way to manage it? So are we being successful or have we been lucky so far? Uh, we've been lucky so far and I think contagion is a, a huge, uh, hugely dependent on investor behavior. And I think investors are thoroughly disorientated. It's less than a year ago when Argentina came out to issue a 100-year bond. They wanted to raise 3 billion. They got orders of 10 billion for 100 years at an interest rate of less than 8%. Um, what happened? We just had one bad harvest, and we've completely changed our opinion on them uh, so quickly. I think we have lost our nominal anchor. So uh, if you take US interest rates, 10-year treasury rates, have halved and doubled in the span of the last four years. That's meant to be the anchor from which every other valuation is determined. So investors, for a whole host of reasons, quantitative easing is one of them, uh, are disorientated and therefore they're, they are very jumpy, very jittery. Uh, and I think this is something which is a concern um, because when reactions are exaggerated, reactions are based on herding behavior. I'm going to sell because you're selling because I bought when you were buying. I didn't know why I bought. I bought it because you bought it. And now when it's come to selling, I'm going to sell it because you sold it. And that pro-cyclicality is amplified in the current environment. Uh, and that is a concern we need to um, be mindful of. Craig Shavhans, who's more concerned now than they were at the start of this session? <laughs> <laughs> Three people at the back. I think it was a back front thing. OK. Um, I'm interested in this. And I'm interested in your uh, disorientation or irrational. And I think you were alluding to irrational. And it kind of plays to your comment, Professor, about the, the fact that, OK, we know more about it. We've been, we're better prepared. And, and there's more kind of wisdom and knowledge of bubbles. And yet there is still this, this, still this irrationality and, or disorientation, to give it a, maybe a kinder word. I would like to echo what uh, Leffy has, has said about, I mean, because I, I largely do my research in behavioral finance, so I totally agree with the hurting behavior, the irrationality in invested reactions. But I think, I mean, it's, it's probably particular in this particular period of time in two ways. One is I think the, the quantitative easing and the tapering off of that is unprecedented. 
and people are known to not be able to make very good decisions in an environment which they are not familiar with. The second is, I think in many of the policies, especially in light of the escalating China-US trade tensions, I mean, it's not based on economic reasons anymore. So in that regard, even if you are a rational investor, you'd have a very difficult time in terms of interpreting and predicting what each government is going to do. I think that's going to add a lot of uncertainty to the um, to, to, to the data problem. And regarding, well, what can we do? And I really don't have any other better recommendations. I mean, I, I, I wrote this book titled The China's Guaranteed Bubble, and then people ask me, what should Chinese government do? Well, I think that the same answer applies here, which is try not to get into this situation in the first place, which is already probably too late. Uh, no, I think, sorry, to agree with all of that, but to say that I think what, the, what authorities can do is let debt be debt. So not foster an atmosphere of implicit guarantee. Totally agree. Where you know you're buying into debt, but what you think you're taking the word fixed income to literally. And I think there is a structural risk inherent in this assumption that I'm buying these safe assets, even if they're triple A assets, that they are going to pay me in, in all uh, scenarios, and particularly at a time when there's been a lot of talk about disruption, um, fourth industrial revolution, trade wars. I think we are disoriented, not just in terms of the nominal anchor, but we're also disoriented in terms of how to frame all of these uncertainties. In the classical textbook sense, we're not in a world of high risk, we're in a world of high uncertainty, where the framework is unknown. And when you're in a world of high uncertainty, you should not be selling options. And that's what you do when you are issuing debt, is I give you the option uh, to, to receive only the upside, and I'm going to take the downside. So the other thing that, that can be done is I think we need to move more towards equity type finance. This is true in the private sector. This is true in the, in the public sector. Governments, for example, I think should be seriously considering GDP-linked bonds. Bonds where the uh, return goes up and down based on performance in the real economy. It's trying to separate underlying performance from this promise of a fixed return, which makes debt structurally uh, problematic. On top of that, you layer in uh, the mismatches that I just mentioned. On top of that, you layer in issues of trust and transparency. That's a cocktail. A heady brew. Um, now let's just see who in the room would like to ask a question. Can I have a show of hands, please? Just one so far. So if you could uh, remind us where you're, your name and where you're from before asking your question. Hi, thank you um, for this informative session so far. My name is Josh Levent. I come from Switzerland. And um, Zuning, Professor Zuning mentioned earlier that um, rapid productivity growth would make high debt manageable. And so I'm wondering, in this age of the fourth industrial revolution and accelerating technological changes, why are we not seeing uh, rapid productivity gains in the economy? It's a fine question. Any more before we, uh, we take a few more? OK, gentlemen at the back, so that's productivity. That's a key one. That's one I was going to ask, actually. That's a very good question. <coughs> Hi, my name's Alex. I'm a university lecturer in the UK here with the Young Scientists community. I think there's some really interesting points about different types of debt and coming up with new ways to structure debt to make them a little bit safer in the long term. Um, but one of the really interesting points, I think, is the speed with which money can leave a given economy. Because that, if, if that starts to happen, that's when you get a contagion, right? So I'm just wondering, and this may be a slightly radical point, whether there's an argument for stronger capital controls in international markets and that sort of thing. And I'd just be interested to hear your views on, on that. Okay, capital controls. Let's do productivity first. It, it's key. We've been producing competitiveness rankings um, for 40 plus years at the World Economic Forum. This year, we're completely, we ripped up our methodology and we're publishing again later than planned because we still took a bit of time fine tuning it. But the, the basic kind of underlying architecture is radically different. And we're basic, I think, it's, uh, I'm not breaking my own embargo when I say, you know, the, 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 the terms of competitiveness have completely changed and they need to be completely re engineered for the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and yet, uh, whether it's traditional productivity or, or, or gearing for that uncertain future that we all face, it seems to be the more difficult option compared to an easier option of issuing money. Um, so apart from the obvious answer, which is it's easier to, to issue, issue debt, what are, we, what are we going to do about that? Should I go? OK. Uh, so on productivity, the short answer is I don't know. This is a conundrum, but I have theories, and I'll give you one uh, or two. How is productivity measured? It's the sum of all of our incomes, recorded incomes that is transacted with an invoice passing amongst us or a payslip involved divided by the number of people in the room. 
if it turns out that a lot of us are now doing and getting for free what we had to pay for in the past, and the income is aggregated by a small number of platform economies um, <clears throat> with a dramatic shrinkage in the margins, profit margins that they are charging for the isolated uh, services, then there might be a measurement issue that we are, uh, the sum of invoices divided by the number of people is giving us a smaller number, or the rate of change of that, growth of that is, is giving us a smaller number. Other theories are about spare capacity being used a lot more. So if, I, if my car used to be my own asset, now, when it's free but from between 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and I drive it on, on Uber, then suddenly that is a, an asset. But I'm not making any new capex on that because I'm utilizing assets that I already owned before. Likewise with my spare bedroom that I'm putting on Airbnb. Um, on the capital controls question, the answer is yes. The IMF now agrees, and this was a few years ago, uh, that capital controls and more macroprudential policies is a perfectly fair game uh, set of tools in the toolkit that countries have, particularly small open economies. Uh, this was not the orthodoxy uh, even 10 years ago. Can I just add a, a couple of things? Uh, regarding the labor productivity, I think my concern, I, I agree with what you have said, I, I, my concern is about the increasing disparity in wealth distribution. So it's about, I mean, it used to be that, well, well I have the money and I want to buy something and I will uh, put that into the market. But now it's like uh, there's a divergence in what well, the wealthier are getting the wealthier and they have the money poured into the financial assets or in real estate, which is not looping back into the product, productive uh, side of the economy. So I think that's one concern. And regarding capital flow control, I think I, in, in theory, we we'll all agree that that is one thing which is uh, not good for the efficiency, but then in light of the, the potential of contagion or financial crisis, I think that is probably the second best that many countries would have to resort to, hopefully not too, uh, too soon in the future. Anyone else for any more questions? Let's just touch again upon the fourth industrial revolution then, because as I say, we're kind of, we're, we're, we're tooling up for it. Um, we produced a report this week, Future of Jobs. We um, conservatively predicted that of the, all of the work task, workplace tasks can perform today, um, over 50% will be done by machines in um, the year 2025, which is not so far in the future. Um, short answer, there's a huge amount of disruption. And emerging markets, as well as having to uh, contend with um, you know, the, the, you know, the kind of ripple effect from developed economies, could possibly find themselves um, you know, less able to leverage the traditional drivers of development, manufacturing-led growth, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, yeah, is that an extra threat for them, or is it a, is it a, is it, is it a kind of isolated um, and, and, and singular challenge? I'm actually quite uncertain about. Well, I mean, it, I, I think the fourth industrial revolution is definitely going to increase or improve the labor productivity, but then at what cost or at whose expense, I think. I mean, it seems that what well, we can make things far more efficiently and do things in a far more efficient way, but then normally that means uh, uh, less demand for labor force. So I'm, I'm not too sure about that one. That actually uh, we're seeing in certain areas in China, in the e-commerce area, in the uh, logistics area, where we're already seeing the, 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 the start of a reduction of labor force in certain areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so for the, the implications are? So I think the fourth industrial revolution is bad if you let it be on its own. There are, it's structurally inequality widening, it's structurally polarizing, uh, and I think it is extremely good if it's proactively shaped. So there is a case now for activist action. Uh, I think government action, but also action from companies. And that's why the WEF report, I think, is very useful, because it highlights the fact that left to our own devices, we have a prisoner's dilemma problem, where individually we're not incentivized to act. But we do need to act, because if you don't shape it, it's pretty bad. The way you would shape it is to make sure that people are able to train, learn, unlearn, relearn on a continuous basis. So. Uh, and really rise above the old binary politics of left wing and right wing, which is unfortunately what's paralyzed uh, democracies in the West, is that you're either in favor of government intervention or you're not. You're either a high spender or you're a low spender. What you really need here is greater market-driven flexibility in the labor market and greater spending by the government for skills retraining and so on. And parts of Asia have risen above that false binary, but that uh, I think uh, has not been appreciated. Uh, and so I make this distinct 
distinction between the two cases where it can be the fourth industrial revolution can be about huge potential, but it can be huge peril. It depends on which path we choose. It's a nice point, and we've got a couple of minutes left, so let's just touch upon this, because I, I like the words activist and, and, and the idea of being proactive, and I like the, the idea of innovating as well. You mentioned GDP-linked bonds. Um, what are the new tricks, the new tools that we've got, to, um, got in the toolkit that could help us ward off any potential crisis? Or what would you like seeing it to, be, to be seen more commonplace? On the debt front, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so like in, in an economy like China's, um, I listened to the Premier's speech yesterday, as everybody else did, and it's very hard to uh, question any part of that. I think, rightly, the focus was on the real economy. The number of times he said, new growth drivers, the number of times he said, innovation ideas. So new sources of growth, reprofiling to consumption services, which basically means we're removing mismatches, which makes debt risky, what I started off by by saying mismatches being a source. And the number of times he said, we will not stimulate our way out of this uh, through monetary means. Although you have to, I think, accept that the trade war makes it harder for China to do the credit market reforms as quickly as they would have liked to do. Because what's the optimum thing to do? The optimum thing to do is to let small accidents happen so that big ones are averted. And in an environment where you're feeling a bit challenged already, you don't really let small accidents happen. At an international level, I remember 2009, Gordon Brown in the UK chaired the G20 meeting, and that was seminal. That was the high point of global coordination, global governance at its best. Um, if we were to hit any, uh, uh, any risk event right now, which is contagious, which passes through uh, complex networks, I don't see us having the ability to convene something like that anymore. So for those of us who are, who are sort of playing on the field, not only is the world uncertain, we don't know whether we're playing football, hockey, tennis, or what game it is, the referees are fighting amongst each other. And that is an extremely uncomfortable position to be in. Can I add a few things? I would very much like uh, to. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with Lofty about the I and mean, then to, to let little accidents happen or let little risks pop up so that you can prevent systematic financial risks. I think that is what Chinese government is saying and that, that, that is what it is trying to do. At the moment, is it easy? It is absolutely not easy, but then we'll see how they can stick to their mm. ground. The first comment. The second is, I'm only using China as an example in a way, I, that's probably true for many other emerging economies, about it's not just about the amount of debt is really about how do you use the debt for? I mean, the uh, fiscal expenditures, do you use that efficiently? Do you use that in a proactive way? And do you use that to, to be more inclusive when it comes down to economic growth? And the last thing, I know it's corny, but then international collaboration. I think it's, it's, cool. it's really hard to believe in such an, uh, an internet-linked era. I think the, the beliefs, the behavior, the, 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 the government policies are still so segregated from each other. And then you can see the one policy which is really in the best, best interest of one country, but at the expense of almost all, everyone else, which will eventually feed back to hurt that one country, which at the beginning seems to be uh, quite, uh, quite, quite, quite innocent. Uh, so, so I think that's a score draw, isn't it? On one hand, we have, um, you know, we have better knowledge of bubbles and, and, and better preparedness and some innovative um, tricks that we can kind of apply. On the other hand, the ability to collaborate is reduced and the irrationality is still hanging around there. Just the one point that I should have mentioned when, when I said we need to move more towards equity-type securities. In the West, large chunks of our pensions have moved away from defined benefit to defined contribution which is really basically admitting that we cannot guarantee you a pension anymore. That is a huge structural change. It's required and is requiring a lot of um, attitude, mindset change. And that is the kind of change we need if we're to move away from being overly dependent on debt and move more towards equity type capital. Is the political will there? It differs from country to country, but Western democracies are harder to get these done in than it is in other types of governance. 
Okay, right, let's just, just start wrapping things up then. Um, last, uh, last quote I'd like to give you, it's not a quote, it's a, I'm paraphrasing, the hedge fund legend Ray Dalio I read this morning in Business Insider says the economy looks like it did in the late 1930s in many ways. Interest rates hit zero in the early stage of each crisis. Asset prices are near full capacity. Interest rates are still low. The wealth gap has widened. Populism is on the rise and global tensions are rising. How correct is he to relate 2018 to the, 19, the late 1930s? Uh, the, the only phrase that comes to mind is that history never repeats itself, but it does rhyme. Right, yeah. And I think the, the, the rhyming is now a lot more frequent. Um, I felt we were here as recently as 2015 when people were talking about divergence. US is breaking away from the rest of the world. Um, Kiwi had just tapered and the US, was, the Fed was going to hike four times in 2015. In the first quarter of 2015, the rest of the world had to cut 22 times. And in the end, the Fed ended up hiking only once. And I feel the same sort of conversation happening right now. Everyone talking about the US <laughs> decoupling, divergence, all of that. I think the US will, flee, will, will feel the blowback of what's happening in the rest of the world very, very quickly. Uh, and that's why this trade war is going to harm them as well. It's not that they're immune from this. I agree with every single word that he has just said. I believe that was the message in your blog which you published a couple of days ago. All right, wonderful. Thank you very, very much indeed for thank joining you. us, gentlemen. Thank, thank you for joining us here in the room, and thank you for watching us live online.